Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Harry Chin from the Center for Smart Health School of Nursing, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Okay, my title of this presentation is Computer Assisted Surgery uh, based on deep learning and uh, virtual reality techniques. I know the symposium is based uh, is, uh, on the technological innovation on nursing education, but my research direction is on using various uh, advanced information technology on various medicine and uh, healthcare applications, particularly for computer assisted surgery. But I think the technologies and the algorithms introduced in this presentation will provide help for the development of uh, innovation systems for nursing education. So what is uh, computer assisted uh, surgery? Uh, actually, in the past 100 years, the surgery become more and more re reliable, uh, precise, and uh, safer. Actually, the term of precise surgery aims to uh, develop using advanced technology, part particularly information technology, to make the surgical procedures safer. So we can look at these figures okay, to check the evolution of modern surgery to see how the surgical procedures become more and more re re reliable, uh, precise, and safer in the past 100 years. So you can see, uh, actually, before the invention of X-ray, as, as we know, the, the, the Congen, okay, the, the, the a winner of the first Nobel Prize for Physics invented the X-ray in, uh, in 1895, okay, before the invention of X-ray. Okay. Actually, the surgeons cannot see the internal structures and organs during the surgical procedure. Okay. They can just estimate, or to be honest, even guess the internal tissues and the locations during the surgical procedure. So it is very dangerous. Okay, so X-rays are very important in maintenance for surgical procedures. You can see at the first figure, the, the, the first figure, you can see that the, a surgeon, okay, and the guidance of a very simple X-ray equipment to do a fairly complex uh, surgery, okay, for patients. But you can see that the, the equipment is very simple and there is no precaution for the harmful exposure. Okay, so with the development of surgical procedures, the second figure is taken at around, uh, also at the beginning of the 20th century. Okay, in, in such a surgery, okay, the, the surgeon is trying to manage and control the high blood pressure of the patients by in, infusing some medicine at the neck side. As we know nowadays, such a way is not e effective and uh, even very dangerous. Okay, and uh, after around two decades, okay, the equipment is not advanced enough to fulfill the requirements of complex surgery. You can see this this photo is taken at the twenties last century. You can see in the operating room, the equipment is also still very simple, okay, and cannot fulfill a lot of complex scenarios. Actually, one of the uh, most important milestones uh, in the development of uh, surgical history is the uh, inv invention of uh, minimally invasive surgery, uh, short for M MIS. Actually, before the invention of minimally invasive surgery, okay, the surgeons usually need to uh, cut a very large incision on the patient's body and perform the surgical procedures. And uh, such a action pose a very high risk uh, to infection, okay, to patients. So we often call such a surgery as open surgery. But compared with open surgery, the minimally invasive surgery, okay, can allow the surgeons to have a very small incision and hence reduce the the, the risk of infection and uh, uh, reduce the uh, recovery time and uh, reduce the uh, wound healing time. Okay, so it is very important uh, invention in the history of uh, sur uh, surgery. 
And nowadays, you can see a lot of uh, minimally invasive surgery systems has been developed, including endoscopy, laparoscopy, and a lot of uh, minimally invasive, so, uh, invasive surgery techniques. And in recent years, robotic uh, surgical systems has been developed. The surgeons can okay, use the robotic arms to manipulate the, the, some uh, uh, surgical devices to perform the uh, surgery and uh, making the procedure more reliable and uh, precise. While well, there are a lot of progress in the surgical techniques, okay, the surgeons nowadays still face a lot of challenges Okay, to perform a, to successfully perform a surgical procedure. Okay, first there are high demands on surgeons and the minimally invasive sur surgical environments. Okay, because the surgeons not only need to acquire the skills on how to uh, operate the the, the 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 surgery and a very limited uh, view, because we just have a very small incision on patient's body and use some. Uh, image to guide the procedure. And also, the surgeons also need to understand a lot of uh, imaging, medical imaging techniques. Because in most uh, minimally invasive surgical procedures, we usually use a medical image to guide the procedure. In some cases, uh, even involves two or more imaging modalities. So it's uh, necessary for surgeons to acquire the knowledge about medical imaging. In addition, okay, if you use robotic uh, surgical, the surgeons also need to acquire the skills on how to manipulate the robotic arms to perform the uh, surgery. So there are still a lot of challenges okay, uh, for surgeons to successfully perform a surgical procedure. Uh, so in such a case, advanced information technology can provide great support and ha help to surgeons to perform these procedures. I will give you some examples to see how uh, technological in, uh, in innovation and uh, information technology can help, help surgeons to improve the outcomes of uh, different uh, surgical procedures. The first example is ultrasound-guided prostate biopsy. Okay, do you know what is a uh, ultrasound guided prostate biopsy? Okay, actually it is a procedure to, uh, if, if, if the surgeons or doctors found there is a spe uh, sus suspicious lesions or tumors on the prostate, usually they need to insert a needle okay, into the prostate and extract some tissues from these suspicious lesions and tumors for further examination. So under the guidance of ultrasound image, okay, this uh, procedure sounds quite easy, okay, but actually in clinical practice it's quite difficult for surgeons, particularly particularly for unexperienced surgeons. For the first challenge is the quality of ultrasound image is uh, relatively low, so it's quite quite difficult for the unexperienced surgeons to find the exact location of the suspicious lesion and the tumor. In addition, uh, when you insert the needle into the prostate, as you know, the prostate is a kind of soft tissue, and the surrounding tissues are all soft tissue. When you insert the needle into the human body, the prostate and the relevant surrounding tissues will, deformed, will be deformed. So the suspicious lesion and the tumors will move to another place so actually, it's quite difficult for the surgeons to ex exactly extract the tissues for, from the suspicious regions, suspicious lesions and tumors. So do you know how, how the surgeons handle such cases in current clinical settings? Actually, they just insert the needle many times from different angles. It is sound ridiculous, right, and quite dif dangerous, right? So in such a case, the computer techniques can help the surgeons. For example, we can segment the prostate and the suspicious lesion and the tumor from the ultrasound images. And during the needle insertion procedure, we can always track, track 
the suspicious lesion and tumor, so that the surgeons can always know where the suspicious lesion and tumor. In addition, we can also use uh, preoperative MR images to register the MR image to the ultrasound image, and then always uh, try to track the suspicious lesion and the tumor during the procedure by registering these two image modalities. So you can see we can use advanced medical image analysis ta uh, techniques to help surgeons in this procedure. So here is another example, partial nephrectomy. So what is partial nephrectomy? Actually, traditionally, when surgeons found a tumor in kidney, uh, usually they, ju they just remove all the kidney. Because as you know, human beings has two kidney. Uh, even if we remove one of the, the kidneys, the other one can still fulfill the functionality. Okay, but partial nephrectomy is an attractive alternative to radical nephrectomy. Okay, removing the whole kidney, uh, usually we call radical nephrectomy. Okay, but compared with the radical nephrectomy, the PN partial nephrectomy with can well preserve the renal prime chamber. Okay, and uh, leads to less chronic kidney diseases and fewer associated cardiovascular events compared with RN, uh, radical nephrectomy. Actually, however, there is some advantages of PN compared, compared with RN. It's quite difficult to completely exercise the tumor while minimizing uh, the functional parenchymal loss in the complicated surgical environment. In addition, it is also very difficult to minimize the warm ischemia of a, a remnant parenchyma of kidney. So in such a case, we can use advanced segmentation visualization and uh, uh, modeling techniques to pre present the surgeons a very comprehensive uh, surgical anatomy to help the surgeons uh, to perform the procedure more uh, precise. Okay. The next example is a shock wave lysotripsy. Okay, it is a procedure to treat kidney stones. Kidney stones. Actually, kidney stone is a, is a very common disease. Okay, it is reported around 12% of men and 5% of women okay, will suffer from the kidney stones in their lifetime. It is also reported about a, a 7 percentage population in Hong Kong uh, will suffer from the uh, kidney stone. Actually, the shock wave lysotripsy, uh, actual corporeal shock li uh, li uh, wave lysotripsy is one of the most commonly used treatments uh, to, to treat the kidney diseases. However, okay, currently in clinical practice, the success rate of shock wave lysotripsy is still not satisfactory uh, in clinical practice. And it is if it is not well planned and predicted, okay, the shock wave will, uh, will harm the surrounding tissues. Okay? So it's very important to make a good planning and prediction of this procedure. Uh, traditionally, we just use some uh, uh, normal grams such as the, the age, the gender, and the body weight to make the prediction. But such a prediction is very inaccurate, okay, usually. And uh, in some cases, we use uh, parameters extracted pr from images, such as the thickness of a muscle layer or the distance between the skin layer and the stone to predict the outcomes of this procedure. But uh, such a prediction is also not satisfactory. So in this case, we can use advanced information technology. We can segment the kidney, the stone, the muscle layer, the skin layer, and also relevant tissues from the images. And uh, using physically based modeling techniques to model the shock wave lysotripsy procedure, okay, so that we can make more accurate and precise prediction and, uh, and, uh, and planning okay, of this procedure. Okay? So you can see, okay, in a lot of uh, uh, surgical procedures, uh, we can use, we can leverage the advanced information technology to, to help surgeons to improve the outcomes. So 
There are a lot of research directions on computer-assisted surgery, okay? You can see from the previous examples I just presented, such as segmentation, segment, segment re relevant tissues and issues for Im images, uh, registration, register two or more image modalities to uh, take advantage of the complementary information of different image modalities, and the visualization, visualize the uh, uh, surgical environment, and the physical based modeling, okay, we can simulate the shock wave release trivacy, right, by some phys uh, physical based modeling techniques. And we can also, okay, using some algorithms to analyze the surgical videos, okay, to see if we can improve in some steps. So all of this can be solved by a hardest uh, technique in computer science and engineering, deep learning. I think many of you has know the deep learning techniques. Actually, okay, I think if you are not working on the machine learning techniques, you may know this technique through this Go game, famous Go game between AlphaGo and uh, and the top Go player. Okay, uh, actually, uh, the AlphaGo is developed by DeepMind, okay, uh, AI uh, uh, based uh, company, okay, uh, of Google, okay. So actually, I'm an amateur Go player, okay, uh, many years ago. Before this match, I don't think AlphaGo can win. Uh, because the Go game is a very complicated game. I mean very, very complicated. Because uh, it is estimated the possible situation of a Go match is equivalent to the number of atoms in galaxies. Okay, you can image the, the game is very complicated. But AlphaGo won the game, and what shocked me more is that during these games, the AlphaGo take some moves that human beings will never ever took. Okay, for example, the moon 10, the moon 12, and in this figure, the moon 27. Human players will never ever took these moves because traditionally they think this bad moves. But AlphaGo take these moves and won the game. So after the match, the top human players carefully study this moves, and uh, currently we still cannot see these moves are good or bad moves, but they found there are really some, they really have, these moves really have some advantages compared with traditional moves. So that means that deep learning te techniques can not only Okay, learn knowledge from human, learn human knowledge, but also can create new knowledge, such as this moves, right? Create new knowledge, okay, based on the human knowledge. This character feature is very amazing, right? So we really want to take advantage of this characteristic takes of deep learning to improve the medicine and the healthcare, application, and performance, okay? So one of the commonly used deep learning techniques is uh, convolutional neural networks, convolutional neural networks. Actually, the convolutional neural networks uh, is a kind of artificial neural network, okay? Artificial neural network. Compared with traditional artificial neural network, the main feature of a convolutional neural network is that it is designed or organized based on the human visual cortex, okay, in which the neurons are organized in a hierarchical way. Actually, okay, many years ago, the scientists had discovered that the, the humans or animals okay, observe the world, observe the things in a hierarchical way. Okay? Uh, for example, for this image, okay, an animal or human being will first notice some primitive features, such as some corners or edges. Then, based on these corners or edges, they observe the bark, leaves, the, the, the parts of the object. And finally, they notice uh, there is a tree in this image. This is because, uh, based on the organization of the cells in the human or anima, uh, animal's visual cortex. Okay, it is organized in a hierarchical way. So actually, simply speaking, roughly speaking, the convolutional neural network is designed 
to simulate the visual mechanism of human beings and animals. Okay, so you can see this is a uh, the typical uh, structure of a convolutional neural network. It is a stack of many layers, including the convolutional layers, the nonlinear layers, and the pooling layers. Okay, they can pass or interpret the scene in a hierarchical way. Okay, I don't want to introduce a lot of technical details here. Then I will introduce some uh, applications, how we can use the CNNs for different uh, medical imaging analysis tasks. So the first one is we develop an end-to-end -end 3D network, convolutional neural network, for automatic segmentation of li liver from medical images. Okay, actually, as we know, most uh, natural images, 2D images, but in medical domain, okay, there are a lot of 3D images, such as 3D ultrasound, 3D CT, 3D MRI, right? So we develop, this work is one of the pioneer, pioneering uh, works, okay, to handle 3D images, okay? So uh, we develop end-to-end -end learning architecture, and there are built-in upscaling layer in the network. And in such a architecture, every workflow contributes to the grand gradients, okay? Particularly, we developed a supervised middle layers during the learning uh, procedure, okay? These are the loss function of the supervised middle layers. And these middle layers, okay, can combat the problem of a gradient vanishing. It is a very common, okay, challenge in training deep neural networks, okay? So such a super, uh, deeply supervised mechanisms can help combat, okay, this challenge. And such a mechanism also uh, allows the early layers, okay, in, to, uh, encouraged to favor highly discriminative features for explicit predictions, okay? Because we inject the, 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 the information in the higher layer, into the early layer. And also, we also input the information in the la early layer to the high, high, high layers, so that to, uh, to prom promote the information exchange between different layers, to make the training more efficient, okay? So next, we also develop a new network for the prostate segmentation from our MRR images. In, in, in this work, we use a very famous technique, residual connections. Okay, actually it is also a kind of skip connection. And it can address the degradation uh, problem. And it can also accelerate its convergence uh, and improve the performance. You can see actually, the prostate segmentation from our MR image is a very challenging uh, task. You can see the, there are large variations Okay, of the prostate, okay, in different patients, uh, in different images. So it's uh, quite difficult to automatically segment the, the prostate from uh, these images. In uh, this work, we propose a new mixed residual connection scheme to handle uh, this challenging task. There are two kinds of uh, connections, short residual connections and uh, long radio connections. Okay, actually the, the, the short radio connections is uh, similar to the original radio network. Okay, but uh, the long radio connections have some uh, compiling characteristics. First, it can connect the corresponding radio blocks within the same resolution in the down sampling and the pass and the up sampling pass, so that it can promote the information exchange between different layers. Second, it can pro propagate the spatial location information forward. Because in early layers, we can extract more uh, spatial local information. So we can propagate the, this information okay, to the high layers. On the other hand, it also can propagate the gradient flow backward okay, from the high layer to local layer, so that to pro propagate the information within the network to facilitate the training, improve the training performance, okay? 
So you can see some of our results. Actually, you can see the yellow uh, lines. The yellow lines are the ground truth. It is labeled by doctors and radiologists. And the red lines, red lines are our results, are the results of our automatic segmentation methods. You can see our results are very close to the ground truth. Okay, labeled by radiologists or surgeons or doctors. So, uh, so, so such a technique can help the radiologists and the surgeons okay, in this uh, tedious and time-consuming task. Uh, so you can see, in a public data sets, our method achieves the first place in this public data set. Actually, uh, we have uh, uh, participant many public challenges. Actually, we have achieved the first place in around 20 challenges, uh, public challenges, okay, in different challenges. So we further, okay, use, develop new networks for prostate segmentation from ultrasound images. Compared with MR images, the main challenge of ultrasound images, the, the quality of ultrasound images is, is relatively low. There are a lot of noises, sparkle noises, and artifacts, okay? So we develop a new mechanism to handle the noises and to handle the, the, the boundary dis, dis, discontinuity, okay? So here are some results, okay? Still, you can see the, the, the green lines are the ground truth, okay, labeled by, uh, by, by uh, radiologists and doctors, and the right line Red lines are our results. Okay, you can see our results is very close to the ground truth labeled by uh, radiolo radiologists and uh, and uh, uh, doctors. Uh, actually, also okay, such a technique can help the radiologists okay to ad identify the boundary of prostate. Okay. <laughs> In addition, we also, as I just mentioned, we also uh, use the the deep learning models for surgical video analysis. Actually, in this work, we integrate two networks. One network is uh, working on the face recognition to automatically recognize the surgical face from surgical videos. The other one is a surgical tool detection. That is to automatically detect the tools okay, from the, the, the surgical videos. We connect these two networks together. Okay, such we can take the complementary information of these two tasks to facilitate the training of the, both of the tasks and improve the performance of both of the tasks. Okay, we also achieve the for, uh, very good performance okay, in a public challenge. Okay, uh, this is video okay, about uh, the surgical video, uh, video analysis, how the, our algorithms to detect the face, surgical face, and the tool in the surgical videos. Uh, you can see, okay, the accuracy of our face recognition and the tool detection uh, is very high. Then uh, there are some uh, future directions. Okay, although the deep learning models have been widely used in various medical imaging uh, processing tasks, analysis and processing tasks, there are still room to further improve the performance. Uh, for example, we can develop new network architectures and uh, training schemes to further improve the performance okay, of the CNNs in various medical image processing and analysis tasks. And uh, in addition, we can develop weakly supervised learning algorithms for some cases because in medical domain, it's quite difficult to acquire a large number of training data. Right? It's quite tedious and time consuming for to allow the surgeons or doctors to delineate, delineate the boundaries of some tissues and organs. Okay, based on my experience, quite the radiologists are quite busy. Okay, quite difficult to ask the radiologists, surgeons or doctors to provide us okay, enough training data. So in such a case, we can uh, use some limited number of training data and even cause costly labeled data from the radiologists or surgeons uh, to train some deep learning models. Okay, such a technique is called weakly supervised learning. 
And uh, the other uh, problem of deep learning is that many researchers consider the deep learning is a black box. You just input the image and uh, output the results. But uh, quite difficult to interpret okay, how we can achieve such a results. Okay, quite difficult. There is no uh, enough theory nowadays okay, to interpret the actions or, 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 or behaviors of the network. So we will still okay, study the underlying theories of uh, machine learning, particularly deep learning, to inter interpret the, the, the results and make the deep learning models more robust and more interpretable. Okay? And uh, eventually, our aim is to use this advanced uh, information technology to more clinical practice. So in the future, we will try to uh, improve our deep learning models and apply it to more clinical applications. Okay. So uh, thank you. That's all uh, for the presentation. Thank you for your listening.